in this service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 150. It's praise the Lord, and praise the Lord in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I invite you to stand as we sing our opening hymn here this morning, hymn number 509 in the blue hymnal. To God be the glory, hymn number 509 in the blue hymnal. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we come for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, 
have mercy upon us. And for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and he has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives a power to become the sons of God, and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. be seated. Our first lesson today is found on page 1,133 in your pew Bible. That's taken from Isaiah chapter 45, verses 20 through 25. Gather together and come. Assemble, you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to the gods that cannot save. Declare what is to be pre presented. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. They will say of me in the Lord alone are righteous and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. But in the Lord all the descendants of Israel will be found righteous and will exalt. The second lesson is found on page 1840. In the, in the Pew Bible, and that's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you and by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the, he like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this manner no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be immature, to be impure, but to live a holy life. Here ends the second lesson of today. Our gospel reading for this morning can be found on page 1522 in your pew Bibles. It's Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Again, that can be found on page 1522. Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. I'll invite you to stand out respect for the gospel if you're able to. Matthew 15, 
Matthew chapter 15, beginning at verse 21, reading in Jesus' name. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman came from that vicinity to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering, suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Here ends the gospel reading this morning. Praise be to the We join with me in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed, and that can be found on page 32 in your blue hymnals. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'll invite the... Uh, church council up for the installation. Dear friends in Christ, you have been elected by this congregation to serve as officers in accordance with its constitution. Hear the word of God concerning the office to which you have been called from Acts chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Here also concerning the duties of the offices to which you have been called. As deacons, it shall be your duty to assist the pastor and counsel him in all his work for the building up of the congregation, to help him in ministering to the sick as well as to the poor and distressed, and in the cultivation of peace, goodwill, and love among the members. You are to assist him in making suitable provision for the instruction of the young, in the maintenance of church order, in the admonishing of the erring, and in the exercise of church discipline, in accordance with your constitution and the word of God. In the absence of the pastor, or if the congregation should be without a pastor, you are to see that the worship services are held at the appointed times and are conducted properly and in order, that the pure gospel be preached according to the faith of the church, the sacraments rightly administered, and that only those who are approved by the constitution be allowed to preach." Together you are to set a good example of, as servants of Christ and as officers in his congregation. The congregation and the pastor need your leadership in prayer, encouragement, and service. In order that the congregation may know that you are willing to take upon yourselves these duties, I ask you, do you accept the offices and duties set before you? And do you promise to discharge these duties faithfully in the fear of God and in accordance with the Constitution, principles, and usages of our congregation? If so, please answer, yes, by the help of God. Yes, by the help of God. The triune God who has called you to the service of his congregation, enlighten and strengthen you in your office, that you may be proved to be good and faithful stewards to the praise of his holy name. Amen. Let's pray. Our almighty God and heavenly Father, you have established within your congregation the ministry of the word and have supported that good work with a variety of spiritual gifts. 
We thank you that you have provided people of good reputation, ready to serve this congregation for your sake. We humbly pray that you would bless them with the presence of your Holy Spirit, that they may have the wisdom and strength to complete the service to which they have been called. Let your blessing rest on this congregation, not only in its temporal affairs, but above all in its ministry. Strengthen and increase the faith, love, and zeal of each member, that your name may be glorified, and that in every place the kingdom of our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grow. Amen. Thank you. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And I'll ask the congregation as well to remember these men in prayer uh, as they have jobs to do and encourage them along the way as well. Our next hymn is hymn number 482 in our blue hymnals. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, hymn number 482 in our blue hymnals.
You've heard the praise, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. It can be easy to think of ourselves as being above its corruption, but there's only one way to know, and that is to see how you handle that power and authority. If you want to find out how you would function as an authoritarian dictator, well, there's a game just for you. It's a card game. It's called The Great Dal Moody. And this card game is based on power. The person who is in the most powerful position, the great Dal Moody, gets to dictate the game or get dictate the rules of the game. And there are a couple of rules that come with the game in order as far as how it goes and how it's to be played. But one of the main rules is that the great Dal Moody gets to do what he or she wants. They have all the power and authority. And each rank beneath the Moody has a certain amount of power and authority, but it dwindles until you get to the place where the lesser peon has no power and no authority. If you get rid of your cards first, then the next round you get to be the great Del Moody and make everyone pay for how they treated you. It's a fun game. I was playing this game with my brother-in-law and his family one time. My brother-in-law is a lawyer. That's good for you to know here. And rules in their interpretation mean something to him, as they should. His mother was also playing that game, and at one point in the game, his mom became the great Del Moody and made a decree that broke one of the rules, one of the written rules of the game. So Jake was put into a bind. How does he, as a lawyer, uphold the written rules of this game when another person, another player, is following another written rule and it contradicts the other one? He tried pleading his case with his mother, but to no avail. She was the moody, not to mention she was his mom. So she called the shots. And to the chagrin of those beneath her, we had to submit to her benevolent rule. Now, her decree was fairly harmless, But others have been known to be a bit more heartless, demanding that people play the game from an entire different room or playing a whole round sitting on their thumbs the whole time. I don't know how you play a card game sitting on your thumbs, but that's for you to decide and to figure that out. You never know how you're going to act until you experience that authority for yourself. And until that authority begins to be questioned and challenged, there is a God who has all authority both in heaven and on earth. And thankfully, he is just, he is righteous, he is gracious, he is loving, and he is good. He is incorruptible. He does not use his power for his own benefit or to put people into their place, but instead uses his power to save those who are irredeemable. I say irredeemable because without God, that is exactly what each one of us are. We're irredeemable without any hope. Our only hope is in the one who is able to do the impossible. In the God who has all power. I invite you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 45. We'll read what Harlan has just read, but we'll start at verse 18. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 18 through 25. I'll invite you to stand out of respect for God's word if you're able to. Isaiah 45, starting at verse 18. Reading in Jesus' name. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in some dark land. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, Seek me in a waste place. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, declaring things that are upright. Gather yourselves and come, draw near together, you fugitives of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idol and pray to a God who cannot save. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. A righteous God and a Savior, there is none except me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. They will say of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him, and all who were angry at him will be put to shame. 
In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. Father God, these are your words, and your word is true. We pray this morning that you would sanctify us in your truth here today. We thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you are the creator of heaven and earth and that you have revealed yourself and you desire to be sought not in a waste place, but you have given us creation to see you. You've given us your word to find you. Lord, you come to us and call us to yourself. We thank you for that work. And Lord, we pray that you would do that work in our hearts and in our lives here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The pericope text for today starts at verse 20, but I wanted to start at verse 18 because it sets the stage for the rest of the chapter. It would be even better to start at verse 1 in chapter 45 and even better to start at Isaiah chapter 1, but for the sake of time, we'll just start at verse 18. The Lord establishes here in this verse that he is the God who has created the heavens and the earth. He is the Lord, and there is none else. Yet people still weren't convinced that these other gods that they had served weren't actually gods and couldn't actually provide what they sought them for. They looked to other gods as providers of all good, in which to find refuge in all need, as one theologian defines a God. Or to have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe in that one with your whole heart. Anything on which your heart relies and depends, that is really your God. In the time of Isaiah, false gods took the form often of metal or wood. They would bow down and worship these created objects, these fashioned by man out of created materials. We're still fashioning gods for ourselves today. They may not be physical in fashion now, or maybe more evolved beyond that, but more philosophical in sense. On what does our heart rely and depend on? Is it on politics? Is it on power? Is it on athleticism or knowledge or family or friends? Influence? Is it on entertainment or security? We've moved beyond fashioning gods with our own hands, but we're still fashioning gods with our own minds and with our own hearts. In verse 19, we're reminded that God is one who speaks, that He reveals Himself, that He declares things that are true. Whether we agree with it or not, whether we like it or not, that's irrelevant. The Lord defines reality, and so we submit to him. When he says that there is no other God, then he means that there is no other God. There is no one else who can provide for all of our needs. There is no one else who can sustain this world and everything in it. There is no one else who is able to deliver our souls. There is no one else who is able to get, cause our hearts to beat, our lungs to breathe. There is no one else who can give us life. There is no one else who can redeem us. We are irredeemable. We cannot save ourselves. Verses 20 and 21, the Lord calls out to the nations. These nations who are worshiping all sorts of gods, inviting them to plead their case for their idols. And God asks them a pointed question, which one of your idols can foretell the future? Which one of your gods is sovereign over world events? Which one of your gods can raise up a foreign savior? And the answer is none. And God invites them to take an honest assessment of their gods and asks the question, can they really save? Do they really have the power that we ascribe to them? Can they deliver what they promise? And can they redeem the irredeemable? At the beginning of the chapter, the Lord declares something. That's way out of left field at the time of the book of Isaiah that God's people were not expecting, that the rest of the nations also were not expecting. God is the God of Israel, and now, here in the beginning of this chapter, he starts to meddle in the affairs of other nations. He says this, Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings to open doors before him, so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. 
I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen, I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. The Lord here in verse 1 refers to Cyrus as his anointed. Another word that means anointed or a more translation for that is his Messiah. God is calling out here to Cyrus saying, Cyrus, I am raising up you to be my Messiah, my messenger, my deliverer. You are my anointed to fulfill my purposes. You are the one who is going to make the rough places smooth for my people, and I am going to make the rough places smooth for you and for your people, partially fulfilling what God and what the Lord declared in chapter 40, comforting Jerusalem with the news that her warfare is ended. Cyrus is the one who declared to the Jews in captivity, you can go back to Jerusalem. You can go back and rebuild your temple, rebuild your walls. You can go back and live in that area again. And at the time, Cyrus's people are just a blip on the radar. No one expects Cyrus and his people to be a world power. At the time Isaiah is writing, it's Assyria. They'd be taken over by Babylon and finally by the Medo-Persians, which Cyrus comes up from. But the Lord is orchestrating all of this. At the time Isaiah is writing this, this moment that he is speaking of is still 150 years away at least. And he names Cyrus by name. And that's not to say that every mother and father decided there's good news about a Cyrus, so I'm going to name my kid Cyrus just to be on the safe side. God calls him by name, effectively saying, watch this. When this Cyrus does exactly what I say he is going to do, then you will know and all will know that I am the Lord. I am God. There is no other. The Lord does what no one else can. Not only predicts accurately the events 150 years from now, but he orchestrates world history to bring it about. The Lord uses his power to, things, to speak of things yet to happen, but will most definitely happen. He's orchestrating world events to call people to himself, to reveal himself to the nations, to show these fugitives from every nation that he and he alone is God. Which brings us to the next thing that the Lord does that no one else can. He invites them to be saved. The Lord calls out to these irredeemable and deplorable people to abandon their gods, to turn to him and what? What does he say in verse 22? Be saved. And who is he calling out here? Is he calling out to Israel? No, God's sights are far more broad or more expansive than Israel. To the ends of the earth, the Lord is calling out in verse 22. These are people actively living in idolatry. These are people who are worshiping false gods and pagan deities who have no care, no concern for the Lord whatsoever. These aren't neutral people who are left to choose their own adventure however they decide to go. No, they have chosen their idols, their idols of wood and stone. They have chosen their gods who are not gods, and they ought to receive God's judgment, not God's mercy. Yet God in his grace comes to them, and he speaks to them. He speaks his word and he reveals to them that there is a God who saves, that there is one who can redeem and restore. And this is the God who calls to them. He is not just the God of this nation Israel over here, but he is the Lord God of heaven and earth. The Lord continues to offer this gift of salvation through his word today and his word has gone forth. His word continues to go forth, accomplishing the purposes for which he sent it, calling sinners to salvation and idolaters back to the true God. He speaks in righteousness again, declaring and defining reality to be grasped by faith. He maintains his power and his authority in verse 23. He says, to me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. He is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and the King of Kings. 
He's the creator of heaven and earth. And one day, all of those who are living in an alternative reality, what we would say living under a lie, those who are deceived by the devil and believing a lie, will experience reality shock when the facade falls down and the Lord is revealed, who he has always said he has been. The Lord has been revealed. Paul points out this God to be the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ. The end, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and those who are on the earth and under the earth, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God uses his power not for personal gain and advancement here, but to serve the interests of others, taking on flesh to be crucified for us. We looked at that more in depth last Sunday. We may like to think of ourselves as not that bad, or maybe even pretty good if we're having a good day, depending on the day. However, we too were all born sinners. We were born into active rebellion against God, conceived in sin, and then born as children of wrath. Every single one of us, it doesn't matter who your parents are, what their situation is. We have a sinful nature that longs to shake its fists defiantly at God. This is a reality into which we've been born. But God, because of his great mercy with which he loved us, Even while we were in this state, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God made us alive together with Christ. And we say it can't be done. We're irredeemable. And yes, that's true. And yet we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And that Lord continues to call out to children of wrath through his word, calling them to repentance from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, calling them to faith desiring to do his work in their lives. And so he says here in Isaiah 45, 22, turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. Does God care for you? Absolutely. Does God care for your neighbors? Absolutely. Does God care for his enemies who are actively opposed to him? Absolutely. And this word of God comes to all people and God brings this offer of salvation. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. The call of salvation rings out today to the ends of the earth, inviting you and all people to salvation. God uses his power to predict and procure future events. God uses his power to bring sinners to salvation, and God uses his power to bring to us righteousness and strength. Verse 24 describes a realization the former pagans, who have now turned to God, realize. Only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Righteousness and strength are two of our modern-day idols that we like to pursue. And the world offers to you a path to righteousness. The world offers to you a path to strength. Righteousness comes through self-justification. Justifying your every action to show how you are not wrong, but that you are right. Or through being on the right side of the hot-button issues of the day. That's how you can know that you are righteous. Righteousness is told that it's obtained, it's told to us it's obtained by who you vote for or which protests you're involved with. Righteousness is is obtained by the stores that you boycott. And it goes on and on. It's an ever-changing list and something that one never fully attains, and it changes with the tides of culture. Strength, on the other hand, is found in pursuing power in any of the many avenues that will give you power. Whether that power is found in influence over others, whether that power is found in and getting a certain amount of wealth, and now all of a sudden you can throw your weight around? Whether that power is found in popularity, or that strength is found in security. The world lies to you. Just as these former pagans who've turned from their idols have come to realize there is only one place where righteousness and strength are to be found. And God's word tells us it's the Lord and the Lord alone. 
The same Lord who named Cyrus 150 years before he was born also foretold of a righteousness to be secured. In a few more chapters, Isaiah will describe the suffering servant who would accomplish this righteousness and justify the many. He foretold of his miraculous virgin birth at the beginning of this book and the work that he would accomplish, saying he would be the Prince of Peace, Almighty God, Everlasting Father. And the New Testament vividly records the fulfillment of both of these prophecies and so many more, affirming again that the Lord is able to do the impossible, that the Lord is in control, and that there is none other, and that the Lord is working for your salvation. If we take a good and honest look at our lives and our hearts, we're faced with a painful reality that we are utterly sinful that we often try to secure for ourselves a righteousness or strength of our own, not from the Lord. Whatever righteousness or strength that we cling to is only a facade. It's no more effective than these wooden idols that these fugitives were clinging to. Yet God invites us to leave these all behind, to turn to him and be saved, to turn to the one who has reconciled us to God, To turn to the one who is both just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. To turn to the one, to Jesus, whose blood cleanses us from all sin. To turn to Jesus, who became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And for those who have been following Jesus for quite a long time, we can look at our lives and we can get discouraged and disappointed, can't we? Because we, ought, we realize that by now we ought to be better, shouldn't we? By now we ought to know better. By now we ought to sin less and less. And the more time that we spend serving the Lord, the more that we spend time in his word and we see his law, the deeper his light penetrates into our hearts. And as we peel back the layers, we see that our hearts aren't getting any better, are they? But our wickedness, our sinfulness, our depravity continues to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And it brings us to a place of despair. where We recognize, God, I can't do it anymore. God, I can't be good enough. God, I have been chasing righteousness my entire life and I cannot seem to find it. We say it can't be done. We can't be righteous. And then we look back at history, and we see all of the other times that Christ has done what can't be done, what couldn't be done. And we see what Christ has done and what his word promises to us. And we rest in the fact that Christ does the impossible. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible, and not only possible, but he has promised to justify all who believe in him. And we look to his word and we see that Christ has promised it. And not only has Christ promised it, but Christ has accomplished it. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. As we look into our own lives and we see how sinful and wicked we are, we can despair and say, God, I can't be righteous. But then we look to Christ and we ask ourselves the question, is Christ righteous? We say absolutely without a doubt, he is righteous. We look again to God's word and we know that this righteousness has been promised to us and given to us. And so while we struggle in this life and we continue to give in to sin more often than we care to admit and we continue to peel back the layers of our heart and we find ourselves not getting any better, we look again to God's word and the promise that you will be righteous in Christ. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. That's true for man, but that's not true for Yahweh. Rather, God uses his absolute power to do for us the impossible, to proclaim, to procure, and to deliver salvation to the ends of the earth, to all who have faith in him, to give us his righteousness, And we say it can't be done, but in Christ, it has already been done. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and for its truth. 
God, we thank you that your concern is for more than the people of Israel, but your concern is for the, Lord, for the world. That you call all people of all tribes, of every tongue, of every nation to salvation in you. That you aren't just the God of one certain people in a certain location, but that you are the God of heaven and earth. And that one day every knee will bow and pledge their allegiance to you. Father, we pray that we would be doing that even now in our hearts, that we would be pledging our allegiance to Christ. God, we thank you for what you have done for us, for using your power not just to promote yourself, but God, for using your power to obtain salvation for us, for calling us out of our darkness and into the light of your beloved Son, for calling us out of sin, out of deception, Lord, out of our wretchedness and into holiness, into your kingdom, into salvation, into your own family. Lord, I pray that you would help this message to stay on our hearts and in our minds when we're told otherwise, when thoughts from within ourselves, when messages from outside of ourselves come in to afflict us and assail us and to say that we can't be righteous. Lord, draw our hearts to you to see that we are righteous in Christ. Father, we pray that you would help us to proclaim this message to a lost and dying world, to see them as you see them, Lord, as souls with an eternal destination. Lord, brothers and sisters, for whom you have died and whom you love. And Father, give us this message to bring to them a message of hope, a message of salvation. And God, we do pray that your kingdom would come amongst them also. All of these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we'll continue our worship service with receiving the tithes and the offering. Our Sunday school offering basket in the back is going to Jonathan and Tamba Abel, our missionaries in Brazil. At this time, we'll take our church offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would deliver us from evil. Deliver us from all manner of evil, whether it affect body or soul, property or reputation. And at last, when the hour of death shall come, grant us a blessed end and graciously take us from this world of sorrow to yourself in heaven. Lord, we do pray for all of those who are listed in our bulletins who are going through various afflictions with their health. We think of Lauren, Donovan, Connie, Alan, Dave, Janelle, Mark, Judy, Steve, Christy, Colby, for John, Emily, Preston, Andrew, Dalton, Annie, Lord, for CJ, Chris and Sons, for Kendricks, for Kim as well. Father, we pray that you would meet them in their time of need and draw their hearts to you, that you would heal them according to your will and your purposes. Father, we also pray for the residents of our nursing homes and assisted living. We pray for Edna, for Erna, for Helen. Father, we thank you for them. We pray that you would continue to draw them closer to yourself. Be with all of the staff as well as they seek to take care of uh, these dear souls. Father, we pray that you would be with the families who are mourning the loss of loved ones. For the Zhao and the Presting family, for the Yoakum families. Lord, for everybody else in our communities too who are mourning and grieving life and relationships that are lost. Father, we pray that you would comfort them in their grief. 
draw their hearts to you, the God of all comfort. We pray that you'd be with those who are pregnant. We think of Edna for Dakota, for Jessica and Hannah. Lord, for those who are trying to get pregnant as well, that you would watch over them. Father, for those who are trying to adopt, we pray that you would be with them. We think of Chance, Lord, for his family too, that you'd watch over them. Father, we pray that you would be with those who are suffering from miscarriage and stillbirths. Father, comfort them as they grieve. Lord, we pray that you would be with all of those who are serving in our military. Watch over them and protect them. Keep them safe. Keep them from harm. Father, we thank you for the security that they provide for us. Lord, we also recognize that you are the one who gives us security. And so we thank you for that. We pray that you would be with our veterans, that you would watch over them and provide for them. Father, we pray that you'd be with all of our students here today. For Jenna, Aiden, Shakira, Austin, Casey, CJ, Samuel, Brendan, Alex, Evan, for myself as well, Lord. We pray that you would continue to teach us the things that you desire for us to learn. Lord, that we would be able to faithfully be students and serve here in your kingdom. Lord, wherever you call us in the various vocations you call us to. We pray that you would be with our country, be with our leaders. We pray, Lord, first and foremost, that you would bring to them salvation. Help them to see that you are a God who cares for them, a God who tells them, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. Father, we pray for their souls. We also pray that you would give them wisdom as they seek to lead us. Father, help them to lead in a way that brings you honor and glory, that brings justice as well. We pray for our police. Lord, for all of those in authority over us, that you would watch over them and protect them. Father, help them to do their job with integrity. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with our communities, that you would protect us from harm, and we thank you and praise you for every single day that you do. Father, we pray that you would bring revival here among us. Pray for all of those affected by the tragedies around the world. Lord, for all of the senseless and meaningless loss of life around the world as well. Father, we pray, come, Lord Jesus. Please return and bring us back to this, out of this world of sorrow to yourself. Lord, your word tells us that you will come at the appointed time, but each day is a day of grace where you continue to call sinners to repentance. And so, Father, we pray that you would do that through your word today. Be with our AFLC and our missionaries around the world. Encourage them in their work and in their ministry. Father, thank you that your word continues to go forth. Be with our nominating committee. Father, we pray that you would encourage them. And put men and women on, on their hearts and minds, men and women who have been uniquely gifted for the roles that are still needing to be filled. We pray for our congregation as well. For those who are seeking to work on our Constitution, Father, we pray that you would help us to be faithful to the tasks that you've called us to. And may our con Constitution be a faithful explanation of what we, it is that we are trying to do, how we are called to serve you. Father, we pray that you'd be with our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world who aren't able to worship freely as we are. Continue to strengthen and encourage them, draw them to yourself. Father, we pray that you would also be with our seminary interns as they are interviewing various congregations. Lead them to the congregations that you have chosen for them. And Father, we pray for all of our congregations without pastors as well, that you would lead trained and qualified men to serve them. Father, that you would also raise up more men as well, men who long to serve you, Lord, shepherds after your own heart, who would shepherd these congregations. Lord, we pray that you would be with our missionary of the month for Jonathan and Tampa Abel. Be with Jonathan as he teaches major prophets and seminary. And Lord, we pray that you'd be with each one of those seminarians in a Brazilian Free Lutheran Seminary. Thank you for that ministry and that work. Father, we pray that you would continue to train and equip more pastors for the work of service in your kingdom. Father, we pray that you'd hear us now with the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Closing hymn this morning is hymn number 84 in the blue hymnal. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hymn number 84 in the blue hymnal. Thank you. 